joined now by a production designer who has worked with such icons as Basil Brush, Morecambe and Wise, The Liverbirds, and of course, Doctor Who. These days, he is perhaps better known as an artist as he paints both uh, Mongolia, India, and various other countries that he's visited on his travels, and also enjoys exploring his passion of boats. So I'd like to introduce production designer, Jeremy Bear. How are you? Hi. How are you uh, you're keeping during these rather strange times? I imagine painting is certainly keeping you busy. Yes, it is. And, and gardening as well, because in, in our other place, we have rather a large vegetable cage. <laughs> and um, there are, as it's, the house is in the wood, it, uh, there's lots of things to do with the trees as well. And I, I enjoy sailing as well with my own little boat. Oh, fantastic. I'm glad you've been able to continue doing that during lockdown. But I wanted to take you back to the early 70s when you first encountered Doctor Who. I actually started with Doctor Who before that because in 1966, when I was a design assistant, I worked with Stuart Walker in his, in his group of designers. And I worked on the black and white one with the original Doctor Who, and that was called... Um, The Savages, and that was recorded at Riverside. So as a design assistant, what would have been your responsibilities? Of course, on that story, at Stuart Walker was a designer. Well, I used to do the working drawings and, and generally help the designer who was deciding what the set design should be. And it, it, was, it was really completely in-house training from the moment I arrived, because... Before that, I worked as an exhibition designer at Beck and Pollitzer. And so I, there I learned how to do working drawings and colored visuals of exhibition stands. And the stands went all over the world. So I was there for about two years. And I got, I saw this ad for a design assistant at the BBC. And that was a year after BBC Two had started. And so I applied and I got in and I, I, I worked in Stuart Walker's group of designers first. In the BBC, there, there were several groups under a, a lead designer. And so there were, in that each group, there were designers and, and assistants. It would have been a department that would have all worked together, even if not on the same productions. So who were, the sort of, who were your peers at the time then that you joined the BBC with? Um, well, there's Ray Cusick and um, Stuart Walker in particular, because I, I was working with them for the period. And then after a while, I went off to Ealing Studios and helped um, the designer who was in residence there with anything that any of the films that were being shot there needed. So that, that was a marvelous experience as well, because big things would come into the studio, like, like Les Miserables, which Peter Seddon designed, and they were used in the tanks. So they had the sewer set where, where the hero escapes through the sewers. They had that built into a tank and out of it. So, I mean, there's a really interesting learning curve about all the different things that you could do in design. And then I worked... The, the BBC had a, a department for training directors and producers, and they, part of their course was to um, produce a half-hour play or, uh, or other sort of programme. So again, I had to make all the sets from the stock BBC stuff for them. And I used to turn it some of the lectures and I remember sitting next to Esther Ransom when she was doing her course. And then, then after about 18 months, I was made a designer and I started with Dixon the Dock Green and Z cars and things like that, all in black and white. And then there were experiments going on at Lime Grove of colour television and Anything red was considered much too bright for the 
the cameras then. So they had, all reds had to be turned down and shiny oil paintings that we hired in for, for the sets had to have a, a veil of gauze put over them to, to cut away the, cut the shine. And then the first ever colour broadcast was from Wimbledon and I did a set for that. So, and then shortly after that, I did one of the first colour outside broadcasts, which was a play set in the First World War called A Question of Honour. Would I be right in thinking it wasn't long after this that you found yourself designing the Anida line? I did a, about 10 or 12 episodes over the years. And when we went filming to Dartmouth, because if you were on the Charlotte Roads, which is the schooner we were using, um, if you weren't dressed in costume, you would likely to, to embarrass being shot because it's such a tight environment. So everybody dressed up. And I think in, in one episode, I'm in several different parts of the world. <laughs> and I, I was dressed and made up as a knife grinder and different sorts of sailor. And, and I had a, a black beard then, so, and long hair, so it fitted in with the period. And, and I had a flat, which was, that, which was actually on the main set, the bit of darkness that they used. And um, we had to do all sorts of things. Like I had to create a Chinese market for one episode on location. Um, and we had to build it in an incredibly quick time. Of course, at the time, that was a very lavish production, which, as well as being a period show, must have been a great challenge for you as a designer. Is period something that you're particularly interested in? Yes, it was, because it was ships and, and boats, <laughs> which I like painting anyway. And um, Oliver Bailden was the first designer on it, and he sort of set it up. But then I joined um, and did a lot of episodes. With a series like that, when, of course, there's an established look for the production already, how much can you make it your own? There were different parts of the world. So there were new sets all the time. And, I mean, even in the, the interiors of different ships. I, I remember I had a, for one episode, I had like a, a New Guinea hut, and it was about um, slaving. And then I had the deck of a clipper in the studio. But obviously it wasn't built to rock. They could only rock the camera. And it was a night, <laughs> it was a night scene. So he had the poor slaves lying about on the deck and, and the main characters up on the poop where the wheel was. And then I had crinkly foil, which the Rock boys move to create a sparkling sea. And that, that works quite well. So that would have been a, you know, a trick you'd pick up from someone like Stuart Walker or Rakers, you know, someone that you had been an assistant to, I imagine. And that's part of your training, I, I'd have thought. Yes, yes. I mean, that goes back. I mean, I was by then a fully fledged designer. And I mean, nowadays it's so difficult because. That people want to find someone who can already do it, not learn on the job. Looking at your career, you've done all sorts of different genres, but is period something that particularly interests you as a designer? Particularly, yes. Um, but also I've done lots of little modern plays. or um, And then we, there's a series of produ a production called Eleventh Hour, where <laughs> we sat... Everybody, the whole team, there were two designers and the directors were Pierce Haggard and Mike Newell, who you will have heard of. The writers included Tom Stoffer, David Edgar, Trevor Griffith and Faye Weldon. And so everybody sat down and decided what was going to be written about for a, a live production on a Saturday evening, straight after. 
the month, I mean, in the week, at the end of the week, beginning in on the Monday. So the sets had to be designed and you had to hire all the props and makeup and costume had to get themselves together. That must have been incredibly freeing for you and the other heads of departments to sit down and actually decide what you were going to do. It was amazing. <laughs> and it was 11, it was, I think, 11 weeks. And it just was continuous. And, but after the show on Saturday, all, all the design team would go to this Portuguese restaurant in the Shepherd's Bush Road, and we'd stay there all night. <laughs> and then <laughs> sort of recover on Sunday and then back on Monday morning to start a new, completely new one. And th they made a documentary of it, actually, about it. Wow, that must have been a really sort of standout production for you. So I imagine something like Doctor Who is a totally different discipline. Nearly every designer really wanted to do Doctor Who because they want to put their mark on it. And, and so when I did... Doctor Who and the Mutant. I could hardly wait to start and I wanted to do something entirely different because I felt that space station, the space station was the main set above a planet which was changing rather in an extreme version of climate change here <laughs> because it, it had two suns and the orbit of the two suns had a terrific effect over a period of hundreds of years. And the people in the space station who were sort of invaders from Earth and out-and-out um, -out imperialists <laughs> um, were trying to exploit the planet, but they didn't understand anything about the changes that were going to happen on the planet, where the, the, the inhabitants would go through a sort of insecty phase before they became ethereal beings who could fly and destroy things on their own. So, so I named the main set was the space station and I decided having looked at what NASA was mocking up for the International Space Station, I mean a long, long, long time before it was actually made, that everything would be terribly lightweight. And, and I felt that science fiction space stations before had been rather heavy. So I designed this panel with hexagonal shapes on it. And so lots of the walls and the corridors were only thin rather than heavy. So I had a sort of circular complex with all the, all the, different bits in the space, space station leading off them. So the center was a, a transporter room when I had uh, revolving doors so that the actors could actually disappear and reappear. So I was struck that, you know, a lot of particularly spaceships at the time are quite flat, but in every room within the space station, there was a lot of levels that either they come in at a level and work their way down or mm. that, is that sort of range of height something that the director had asked for is that your your way of sort of trying to get away no, from no, the, the studio floor? Mine, mine was all on one level but it was radiating out like from a so it was circ, sort of circular and the rooms all led off and, they, and other other things could be used for the where the people arrived on, on the planet's surface, and like an airlock and a, a guard post. But obviously the, the transporter bit was used for, from the space station and on the planet. And then we shot in a quarry, a chalk quarry, and, and in the Chislehurst Caves. And in the chalk quarry, we had lots of smoke and there were dry, because it was February when we were filming, there were lots of dry buddleia bushes. So I got the painter to spray all those silver and that with the fog made it quite atmospheric. And then the Chisel Hale's cage, we had lots of different colored lighting and I had some, the, the sort of 
slogans from the language of the, the planet, which I painted onto the walls. And then we had lots of glitter mixed with wallpaper paste on the walls as well. And in 2011, um, they made a, a, DD, a DVD version of the show and the remaining cast like Katie Manning and the director and other people involved and myself were interviewed as a commentary part of the DVD. And I was told that the, the stuff was still there in the caves. <laughs> It sounds as though you had a real impact on the quarry, even today. But I wanted to ask about some of the locations within the story. As a designer, how much involvement do you have in finding them? Because, of course, one cave is very different to another. Well, that was sort of the idea, yes. I mean, the location manager um, found it. I used to go with it. I mean, you, the designer usually goes with the location manager to suss out what might be used. So. Um, so the, the location manager isn't working totally on his own. He has a, so yes, I mean, uh, uh, we went to the, because we, we wanted something like the surface of a, a changing and different planet that, and because it was February, there weren't any leaves, which would have rather spoiled it. Of course, within the caves, there were a lot of bright lights to suggest different areas. I noticed that bold colours is also obviously within your artwork as well as your drawings of the set. Is that something deliberate, perhaps, as a sort of result of having worked so often within black and white? That, that is an influence. I mean, you, it's a way of thinking that if it will work in black and white, you can add colour and um, create a different impression from just... Um, thinking only in colour. This is a sort of crossover. Well, of course, when you were working in black and white, the sets were in colour. You know, they weren't themselves just black and white. Still in colour, yes. But you have to, you, you'd you have to think. I mean, it's like in the early films when the makeup was incredibly white and thick, because otherwise it would be possibly rather blurry and insipid. So you can create the same accents. Um, if you wanted something to go into the background, obviously you'd have a, um, rather than a black curtain with a pattern on it, you'd choose a gray or yellow or red, which would be have a, a softer effect in, in black and white. Do you remember much of um, Stuart Walker's sets on the Savages? Were they quite vibrant, or, or, or just again, there's a lot oh, no. of it, it, it was, it was like there was a lot of rock face, which was like sandstone, which had been pitted with water over the years. So it was like a holy cheese, <laughs> like Gruyere. Gruyere. And, and plant, obviously lots of plants. And that was the main set in the, in Riverside. And then obviously there was the TARDIS, but they, the whole of the studio, which wasn't that big, was all as a landscape. Chris Barry was the director of the Savages and of course the mutants as well. So it must've been nice that when you designed the mutants, you already had some sort of shorthand and working relationship with him. Yes, but he did leave it a lot, Stuart, um, and to me. But, I mean, he was very pleased with what happened in both cases. And it was only a couple of years later that you found yourself designing another Doctor Who story. I started what, an episode called The Seeds of Doom, and I designed an Arctic base, and the special effects people made a model of that. But then I became ill, and because it was so close to the next lot of episodes. Um, Roger Murray Leach took over that and did all the rest of it. In that instance, how much would you have to do with the model shots? Because of course you've designed the physical set, but not necessarily the exterior, which is of course a model. That was the special effects department. And um, obviously I talked to them what about, about what I was doing 
inside the space station. So it would tie in what they were thinking of doing with the rockets arriving at the space station and the shape of the space station. Yes, yes. I mean, you talk to everybody in the team. Was Doctor Who a particularly challenging production to work on? Because, of course, there's often so many elements to consider. No, I mean, it's like a big play, but it's just um, where a play might have lots of sets. Um, no, it's not a challenge if you're up to it. And, <laughs> and, um, and I thought it was a, a real chance to show what I could do. So that was really important to me. I was very interested to see your pencil designs for some of these sets. Would you always go into that level of detail for every production or indeed every set? No, not at all. No, we often made just models which were cut out from the working drawings and to take to rehearsal and to show the director and the lighting director. No, no, I didn't do, I couldn't do sketches like that all the time. But the sketches, the technique in the sketches was the same one I used for the visuals for exhibition spans. So I'd already learned to do that. Away from Doctor Who, I wanted to ask about another television icon. It's Basil Brush. The same actually applied because there was a different theme to the set each week. And one I particularly remember is that he was in... Obviously, he always had to have something which he was, he was in <laughs> for the puppeteer. And he was on sitting, apparently, on a, a big tree stump in a sort of waste area. And behind him was a, a railway viaduct. So that was all built in the, in the theatre. And then we had um, a moving train effect going across the bridge with lighting. And I don't remember all the others, but they were always different and quite fun to do. And in contrast to Basil Brush, Welsh at YTV, you found yourself working on The Sandbaggers, which is a series all about spies and you know, political intrigue within Whitehall, which must have been very different to work on, I imagine. But there was lots of filming outside and just using places. And, but, and we filmed in Malta as well for quite a lot of the, the series I worked on. But I, I mostly at York Television, because I was also head of design after a year, um, I used to concentrate on one-off plays. And the, the first one I did was, was a huge set with um, modern, um, completely modern settings, but I had, the sets adjoining each other, so you could look out of one set to see the exterior of another set. And there was sort of a posh restaurant and a Moorish hotel and all sorts of things. So how different was YTV to the BBC to work for? Because, of course, the BBC was thought of as you know, a television factory. Were they different? I'd worked with the head of drama, David Cunliffe, on the Old Eden line, so I knew him very well. And he was the one who decided more or less which designers would do which thing. Um, so I was always having meetings with him to discuss and trying to push some of the in-house designers as, as well. And whilst at YTV, I'm about to think he worked on quite a prestigious version of uh, Frankenstein. That was directed by James Ormerod. I, I worked with him several times. And the cast, Robert Carl was Frankenstein. David Warner was the monster. And Sir John Gielgud was the her blind hermit who looked after the monster when he'd been cast out. And Carrie Fisher was the heroine. Certainly was a fantastic cast. But I wanted to take you away from television for a minute to talk about your painting. Because, of course, we can see behind you a couple of examples. Is that something that you've always done, or is it now that it's become a bit more prominent? I mean, it's totally more prominent now. I mean, I didn't really have time through all the different productions that I was doing and the other things I did as head of design to do many works of art at all. 
and and in 2000 I um, decided to go to university which I hadn't done before and I did a digital imaging MA at the at the um, London Met University and I chose to do 3D animation and I'd never used a computer before so and that was supposed to be a part-time course but it was pretty full-on and um, I made for my end product I made a, an episode of what could have been a continuing one about 3D animation about a pilot with a with a small plane in in the in New Mexico because the landscape was so interesting and nice to model, and he was set out to find his friend who'd been captured by these um, Native Americans on a, who lived on a mesa in a way. So he found it, and the end of the episode is he gets shot at by the by the Indians, and then he, his plane crashes. So it could have gone on. <laughs> it was a, It took ages to make it. And after that, I never really used the 3D animation again because everything to do with 3D animation, it, you're just part of a big team. I mean, you, you could see when you look at the titles on an animated film, how many different sorts of people are involved. And so, and then I, I did start painting and then I'd never really thought of it, exhibiting, I just liked doing it. But we met someone who owned a gallery and she came round and said, right, because I had lots of different boat paintings and drawings of Hastings fishing boats. So the film, my first exhibition called Working Boat, was called Working Boats of Britain and Europe. So is it boats that particularly interests you? You mentioned earlier that you were sailing yourself. I exhibited boats first, but then I started, after I'd been to India several times, and when I'd been there for longer, the year after that, I decided I just had to paint the people I was seeing. And I'd never, I'd painted small people in visuals, and I'd done a whole lot of drawings, in black and white for television productions like the Oneidan Line and Comedy Playhouse and um, prospective films set in Russia. But, but somehow I was totally inspired and I just started painting like all these people like you see behind me. Again, colour is so important within your work. Is that what makes places like India and Mongolia so interesting to paint? I mean, in India, every, everywhere you go, there's brilliant colour assaulting you. So if you don't use that palette, it just wouldn't be true to how it is at all. It's worth saying that, of course, alongside your painting, you also put together short films of your experiences of cultures as well. That was inspired by India because my daughter's an anthropologist and she was happened to be doing a year's work there. So we went to, to join them for oh, just over a month and I persuaded her she should buy a camcorder and make some films of the people she was working with. So I shot four or five, enough for four or five documentaries about different people um, the River Pilots, I made, we made together one film on the River Pilots on the Hooghly and another one about the shipbuilding yard. They were making, in, in this yard, they were making ships for Europe and they had teams of people sort of supervising it from Germany and, and all the Indian ones as well. And it wasn't, I wanted to see it launched, but it wasn't actually launched before we left. <laughs> so that was a film about, and because it was anthropological, there were interviews with the workers, different workers and telling their life story. 
and that was fascinating. And then we made one about the, the boats that collect mud and sand from the river to be turned into concrete blocks or bricks for building. And they're like, they don't own the boats. There's the boat are owned by other people and all these people and getting the sand they were getting in the water up to their necks and scooping up sand and throwing it into the boat and mud, they get the river mud which gets turned into bricks and they toss that into a, into boats like, like these <laughs> that that the tide is really really strong in the Hooghly, so they can they can't really row against it. They can sort of go with the tide, and where they end up before the ebb starts, they collect the mud, and then they come back on the the, the change of tide. And they do use sort of sails made of sacking to help them when they need to, or they can row as well, but not against the tide. <laughs> So we talked about your television work, painting you've done to date. What's next for you, Jeremy? Have you got a project in the works at the moment? I want to build a series of Mongolian ones. So um, um, there were lots of fascinating people there, like him. Um, so I want to do some full-length portraits of some of the people we met, like this guy and um, ready for Leslie's next series of exhibitions, et cetera, in October. So is there anywhere in the world that is on your list to explore next? Well, we've been to Japan, and I did do a, uh, a few paintings of the, of the geishas in Kyoto there. They, in the old part of Kyoto, there, they wander around in their beautiful costumes and and I I painted two pictures, no, three pictures of the, the geishas out in the streets. And but I haven't that that's another whole series. <laughs> and then I have a series of portraits of craftspeople from the Sussex Guild in in Sussex. Um, metalsmiths and um, wood turners and so I like I like to do the drawings of them and, and paintings of them actually either handling some of their work or working in their workshops uh, but sort of India and, and Japan and Mongolia have got a, a bit in the way of that because there are a lot more to do if if I'm just stuck in this country and I can't travel abroad I can take up that series again. Well, yes, of course, you know, make the most of it while you can. But as we're talking about future projects and things to look forward to, I think that's a lovely moment to end on. So I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time, Jeremy. It's been a joy to talk to you both about your artwork and your television career. So thank you so much for your time.